Hi, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our closing event for the fourth edition of Transoceanic Visual Exchange, or TVE, which is held between November 2021 and February 2022. This iteration of the program has been a collaboration between the Fresh Milk Art Platform in Barbados and Teoretica in Costa Rica, and it has allowed us to present a selection of recent video artworks produced in both Central America and the Caribbean. Chose through an, chosen through an open call and a community-led curatorial model in the form of a virtual exhibition. For this final event, we've invited some of the participating artists from across both regions to be in conversation with one another, with the aim of putting their works in dialogue and deepening the understanding of the themes and relationships that connect recent audiovisual practices of contemporary artists from Central America and the Caribbean. Because tonight's conversation is going to be held in both Spanish and English, if you should need um, at any point to have a translation, we do have a translator um, who will be doing a live, live translation on hand. And if you go to the bottom of your Zoom screen, click on the three dots, or if you see the, the translation icon and select the language that you would like to, he to hear your translation in. And our translator will do the rest for you. I'm going to hand over now to Paola um, from Theoretica Fresh Milk Partner Organization, and she's going to introduce the participants for tonight's conversation. Thank you. Gracias, Catherine. Um, el conversatorio de hoy va a ser moderado por nuestro invitado, Russell Watson de Barbados. Tonight's conservatorium will be moderated by Russell Watson from, a, from Barbados, who works as a um, professional in media and in transdisciplinary artist. Also, Russell was a part for the curatorial community practices that took place in the country. Y a partir de las cuales se estableció el, el marco curatorial para este TV4. Los artistas que son parte de la exhibición y que están presentes en esta conversación hoy. Are here with us today are Kela Archer from Barbados, Marilyn Borbor from Guatemala, Natalia Las Puerto Rico, Milko Delgado de Panamá, David Gams de Martinique, San Martín y Patricia Villalobos de Nicaragua. Muchísimas gracias a todos, todos y todas por acompañarnos hoy. Y sin más, eh, yo le cedo la palabra a Rosel para empezar nuestro conversatorio, evento de cierre de TV. Rosel. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome. Um, so I'm, I'm going to make the assumption that um, asumir que todos ya pudieron eh, ver. You know, do synopses or descriptions, but rather try to get into um, where I'm, I'm seeing like uh, the connective tissue um, aesthetically and stylistically and thematically. And so one of the things, um, at least with the, with the artists who are present um, for this discussion, um, is, you know, there's a, there's a fine line between this kind of work and documentary. You know, documentary has this wide spectrum of approaches, you know, from the, the kind of very expository to the very personal and poetic. Um, but it is a, a more kind of conventional cinematic genre. And many of you have approached topics that, you know, are well suited for a more traditional documentary. So my first question to all of you, I guess, is why did you choose this form as opposed to a more conventional documentary approach? Anyone can go. I'm going to jump ahead to break the ice. <laughs> Hi, everybody, um, all of the virtual audience and companions and colleagues. Um, and nice meeting you, Russell, because I have never met you, but I'm meeting you virtually. Um, for me, I think in the work that I did, um, I was working very intimately with my mother 
um, for over eight years. And there was so much meat and content in our relationship that is very, very close to reality, you know, because she is my mother and there's so much that is inescapable. But I think in the very long process of interviewing her, I started realizing that working with the truth, um, that I needed to sort of reconstruct the truth in order to get to where I wanted to get, which was a deeper truth in our relationship. Um, and it was much more, I think, my interest, um, because also I grew up in Puerto Rico, and I think my perception of truth is very skewed already, because I know that the history that I've learned all my life is not the, is not the real history. I'm still trying um, in my 30s to reconstruct and understand what is the history of this place, because it has always been given to us through a colonial construct. So I think in working with my mother, I was more interested in, in giving her the opportunity to reconstruct and redefine her memory or reconstruct and redefine her perspective of truth and how she wished to remember as opposed to doing a verbatim, verbatim reenactment of her past. Um, and I think even you know, in most recent times when both of us have reflected in the piece, we have also understood that because film is a permanent form, quote unquote, which I don't think is true. Um, we are facing even our past selves, which are a fictional, are fictional to our present in a way, because we the first thing that my mom says every time she watches the film is I am not that person anymore. We need to make a new one. <laughs> if I want it, you know, if I really want to be true. So it really comes to a point where I feel that my interest is not truth as much as it is that there's a multiplicity of versions of truths and they're all equally valid even though I don't agree with them um, and I feel that was sort of the predicament in the very long editing process of this film and in all, in all of my work is you know I'm not interested in one type of truth. Um, I, I, Marilyn with with your project I think it you know it was it was so kind of you know self-referential to um, the gallery context. I mean, the journey that we see this individual go through um, puts the, the, the experience that you're talking about in this representational mode, right? This idea of art in the gallery and this art moving into the gallery. I'm wondering why you chose that action as a representation of, of the, the process of changing one's name, this very kind of, you know, culturally specific historically referential thing. Ok, sí, eh, la pieza realmente duró un año. Eh, cambiarme los apellidos duró un año, el proceso legal. Sir names, uh, the legal process lasted for a year. So there's a lot of documentation. Hay pinturas, hay dibujos, hay videos, porque es un, una pieza tan grande que abarca tanto que es necesaria traducirla a muchos idiomas, como a muchas formas. Y yo dejé que se fuera transmutando ella sola y que fuera lo que quería hacer, ¿no? Como que si era foto, que si era archivo, eh, que si era video. Eh, también sucedió que la pieza viajó mucho y la forma más fácil de que una pieza viajara en este caso era a través de un video, ¿no? Como de, de una documentación de, esta, de este tipo. Y eh, esta... Esta documentación se hizo en Berlín porque había una similitud en relación al proyecto en Berlín. Es decir, a las personas en Berlín también les ofrecían cambiarse los apellidos para ser más alemanes, ¿no? Para pertenecer. Y eso es lo que estaba pasando en Guatemala, ¿no? Te ofrecen, el sistema te obliga a cambiarte los apellidos para pertenecer. Eh, y bueno, esta, esta es la razón por la cual decidí que también fuera un... un esta documentación, la documentación de esta forma. Um, I, I, so I would direct um, the same question to um, uh, Bilko, am I pronouncing that correctly? Yeah, so I was, um, you know, I watched your piece in that first moment um, where it's almost three minutes of this static shot of you walking towards the camera. 
Um, and I'm always, you know, I'm always fascinated when filmmakers make choices like that because, you know, you really kind of challenge the audience's attention to stick with the story. And I think because the history that you're trying to address um, with the piece is one, you know, that is very full and potent um, to take the opening of that, uh, of that story and make it um, durational in a way, not expository, not full of, you know, kind of um, uh, set up information to give us a sense of where we are in the context and so on. Um, I, I, I'm curious about how you come to that comfort level with that kind of vagueness um, of, of information. Because it's more, it felt a lot more visceral and sensorial that that was the thing you were getting at. It wasn't really about, you know, telling us this kind of chronological um, social history. Um, creo que eh, mi caso pasa un poco también como, como Marilyn, la investigación fue una investigación eh, in situ y, y documental mucho más tradicional, eh, con muchas entrevistas, con, con mucho material de archivo, investigación previa. Eh, pasa un poco, pasa que yo soy de, de este lugar donde, donde eh, grabé, que, que es donde pasó toda esta problemática en torno a, a, y sigue pasando, no existen todavía problemas que, que son ¿no? vestigios de, de este extractivismo bananero. Eh, y el, el, el video performance o estas tres acciones son un poco eh, la síntesis, una síntesis personal de toda la, la, la información que recopilé, ¿no? Porque hay cosas muy particulares que a mí me vinculan a, a esta situación y que, fueron lo que, que fue lo que detonó un poco eh, la investigación, por un lado. Eh, mi familia viéndose afectada también y yo como resultado de este proceso y por otro lado eh, eh, había eh, un tema en particular que eran las enfermedades que se generaron a partir de, de los agroquímicos y pesticidas, a mí me diagnosticaron eh, hace unos años con cáncer y me tocó hacer tratamiento de quimioterapia y un poco eso detonó que eh, hiciera como una investigación en torno a, a digamos como eh, toda esta contaminación y enfermedades que surgieron de entonces, eh, más allá de, de, por un lado, también me, me interesaba mucho acercarme a, a, a personas que habían eh, o estaban en situaciones como similares a las mías, eh, documentar esta, esto, este material, y con este material, digamos que mi idea es en el futuro poder generar un corte más documental, pero en principio la pieza eh, o el trabajo que hice era un trabajo más personal, ¿no? como de acercamiento a... a a este espacio y, y sobre todo eh, con la cantidad de información que, que, re, que recolecté y entrar como a un entorno tan complejo, a mí me dejó emocionalmente eh, en una situación donde necesitaba procesar, eh, digamos, toda esta información que, que, que tenía, ¿no? Y la forma de hacerlo fue eh, esta síntesis de, de tres acciones eh, performáticas que representan, eh, que para mí representan distintas, eh, las, las, digamos, condensan las tres más grandes eh, problemáticas que estaban pasando en, en este territorio, ¿no? Y por otro lado, eh, la decisión de grabar de, de esta forma también viene en poder un poco eh, tener que, que el entorno donde se estaba grabando, no sucedía, sucedía en la acción, estuviese, estuviese también un protagonismo, ¿no? Estuviese presente y pudiéramos reconocer que estábamos en medio de una plantación bananera que, que era un espacio de cosecha, que era un antiguo ferrocarril, que era una antigua eh, fábrica eh, de una empacadora que estaba abandonada, ¿no? Entonces, digamos que por un lado está la presencia de mi cuerpo y por el otro también el mismo entorno como, como una especie de, de, de personaje, ¿no? De... So this, this approach, this idea that, you know, dealing with, um, you know, these kind of large, complex social histories um, requires a more kind of didactic approach is, is also um, upended in, in your work, Patricia, where I think, you know, this little sliver of 
visible information that we get in your piece, this line that is moving across and as the images are changing, is that we never really get a full sense of any of the images. Um, and there seems to be this, you know, deliberate attempt to reduce the audience's access to the fullness of the picture. Am I, am I correct in, in, in how I'm looking at this? So I'm just wondering why, you know, once again, I'm trying to poke at this issue of why, why not um, the formal documentary, especially when you're dealing with these, these um, large social history uh, projects. I mean, in my case, I think that not unlike um, some of the ways that people have talked about truth, perhaps, or the reality of something or what you're seeing um, in person, and that somehow that truth, even when it gets out, it's not believable, or it's not enough, I guess. Um, and there's something about I guess the collapse also of media perhaps, or there's maybe a, an embedded critique, or I was trying to think about it as an embedded critique of, of media in a sense that um, no matter how palpable or how real or how um, explicit the imagery is or what we're hearing, if it's a video, um, it's just not enough. Uh, we, we're not able to see it, we're not able to hear it, we're not able to connect. And uh, I think it, um, for me, working, um, working the piece that way, and it's also made up of stills, they're actual photographs that have been made into a video. So that's also, you know, a component, I think. Um, and uh, you, you're not able to maybe, there's a scanning that's going on um, in the image, and for me, the the blurriness, the abstractness of that, the um, inability of us to be able to connect with that larger issue, and in in particular to the events that occurred in Nicaragua in in May and, and in April of 2018, and that in many ways have continued to uh, to exist. Uh, what whatever you may think about what's happening in Nicaragua you know, the violence of that has marked all of us. I mean, it's, uh, it's really been um, quite bloody. Uh, many people lost their lives. Many people are in exile. And so um, I guess uh, my frustration, not only with uh, the way that the information gets out, but also about my even out, even myself, I fall into the trope, you know, and I think that I guess it's something that I'm wrestling it, uh, with, both when I'm in Nicaragua, but also when I'm outside as, as being part of the diaspora. This is, um, this is interesting, you know, the idea of media, um, or, or the value or the purpose of media as being purely about its kind of information transfer capacity. Um, is something that I think this particular form constantly rejects, you know. Um, it is very comfortable being almost obtusely poetic. And so that brings me to your work, David. Um, you know, and your work kind of, at least the work for, for this uh, collection mm -hmm. here, um, exists a little differently in the sense that it was, it was commissioned for a specific acknowledgement of a historical event right, by um, a government, right? And so I think, you know, as opposed to the other folks whose motivations may have come from a more personal place, um, am I correct in assuming that the way in which you approach this was with a more clear intention to satisfy these kind of, for, well, maybe it is the right term, propagandistic um, kind of information needs of, of uh, Ministry of Culture or whatever. Hey, good evening. Um, so the the process in this work, um, um, the, the composer um, Emmanuel Cesar, uh, uh, Manuel Cesar, um, so happens to be like also the director of the National Theater of um, of Mountmead. So the commission wasn't from like the government, but um, I I. I experimented some works personally um, on his music before, 
because it just like took me in the guts and just carried me in spaces where I wasn't expecting. So during the year, I showed, I sent him randomly um, some visual experimenting experimentations, but it was more like generative, just exploring um, possibilities um, that this type of um, music could have um, figured. And it so happens that um, he contacted me afterwards for this um, resistance um, team that's um, part of the 22nd of May in Martinique, which is the um, date of the liberation of the slaves. So the work that he did, the musical composition that he did um, in that album talks about the, the march to freedom, um, la marche la libertad, la liberté of this population of the French uh, uh, diaspora population. So the work that I did um, was trying to depict uh, my personal interpretation of um, how you can actually be in a revolution, a part of a re revolution, but as a collaboration with uh, my students that are, were second year students at that time. And I wanted to use this figure with um, young figures um, to go beyond um, the expectations of what could have been my interpretation, my personal interpretation. So um, I had like total freedom to express what I wanted. And I, at no, at no point, I was, I felt like um, obligated to stay in a certain frame because um, when you read um, Manuel Cesar's um, poetry, he's quite revolutionary, revolutionary um, in his way of um, approaching things. So I knew that um, whatever echo that I could have uh, give or whatever color I could have give to his music um, could only broaden the, the, the discussion about a, a French population that's um, so under the influence of France um, that's not um, free, that depends a lot on, um, as we say, the, the grants, the, the um, subvention um, in French. Um, so it was a, a way of um, saying that, hey, we are from an island. Um, we are actually um, not necessarily listened to, not necessarily heard, but there's a sort of movement because the whole, the whole experimental video is based on movement um, inspired from the, the Goka and the Bel Air. So those are traditional dances, resistance dances that you have in Guadeloupe and in Martinique. So that's what you see the students actually dancing on um, and how they could have interpret those dances to a more classical music that doesn't really has like always a direct um, reference to it, but does have chapters where you can hear those melodies. So it's a, it was a way to, um, to show something that's quite aesthetic, but it became that way. I, I didn't really plan it. I didn't have like a script um, when I was doing it. I just like, um, figured recipes with the programs that I use and the codes that I use to pick up the frequencies. And it gave by accident or by the cosmos ranging to it, this um, quite um, stellar or cosmic um, um, journey. So I, I've never used like, the documentary form before, like the documentary, because I'm not a, I don't consider myself a filmmaker, but more an artist that experiments in video, um, in um, traditional media, but more in a sort of abstract way. So I stick to that sort of um, field um, that, that allowed me to, by the abstraction of things, maybe to say even more than what I would said if it was really a script um, interpretation uh, as I could have done in a different project. You know, this, this approach is kind of, you know, this welcoming of the improv improvisational um, and the happenstance is one of the things that really kind of separates this mode of media making from traditional cinema. You know, traditional cinema really depends on a lot of pre-planning and, you know, um, and I think in your work, Kayla, you know, the kind of breakdown of any sense of narrative and this kind of you know chaotic stream of consciousness composition that you put together really um you know it it kind of straddles that world a little bit you know um and so uh, you know if david does not consider himself a 
filmmaker in that sense. Do you, do you consider yourself a filmmaker? Um, well, this was actually the first film I've ever shared. Um, and I guess it's something that I would like to aspire to. I don't know if I would claim that at the moment. Um, but it, for me, it was somewhat of like a collage. I've done collages before and my primary mode of, of, I guess, expression, both personally and I guess what I share is writing. And then this short film came as a result of just being unable to find words in either Spanish or English um, to really exercise what I was feeling. For me, I think quite a few of the responses of the other participants kind of resonate with my own um, experience and my own motives for creating this. I actually didn't have any intention to share it at all. Um, it, it really was an exercise of maintaining sanity, particularly during the period in which Barbados was under the volcanic ash. And that just put me in a situation of isolation within the existing pandemic isolation, within the existing overall um, environmental and social anxiety that I had to make something. And then it was later on in May that I saw the call for submissions. And I thought, you know, I've been craving this connection. I've been craving a conversation. I've been craving, um, you know, sharing this kind of expression for a long time. So I just, I, I threw it in there. And I actually have regrets about the fact that when I, when I, submitted it I added in the subtitles so I added in my stream of my stream of um, conscience and I think it was coming from a somewhat lonely place at the time I think I just wanted to share these broad questions um, with this public out there and see what happens um, I think what Natalia said about truth is very interesting and I think that's also where I was coming from in the sense that I had done some courses at university dealing with empire and post-empire and I was doing research with a thesis and with you know academic um, procedures sort of dictating that but it felt like quite insufficient um, and when I moved back home I got really into Kamal Brathwaite and his work on the history of the voice and you know what he poses as a problem of us being taught and brought up under a certain educational system that prioritizes a certain way of thought, a certain way of expression, um, that you know certain rhythms, the pentameter that just don't fit with the reality here. And so this chaos was just kind of me grasping for something that felt actually reflective of, of, of a feeling I was feeling and something that I wanted to share because I felt like it is relevant in the moment. I see other people sort of grappling with the same, you know, other brilliant artists in the regions grappling with similar, um, you know, themes and, and we're sort of uh, obliged to deal with these in the region at the moment. Um, I, I feel like I might have used my words in the subtitle as a crutch. Like I sometimes think maybe I should have just left it visually and 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 that might have made it a bit more, you know, open to other possibilities of of, of experience. Um, but yeah, if, <laughs> I hope to make more. I felt like it was a it was a gratifying, I guess, project in the end. Um, to have have a means of connecting during this very disjointed period of time. I, I think this is, um, you know, in, in thinking about video art and expanded cinema, one of the things that it draws up immediately is, you know, I think from, from the time people started using terms like that is that, how is it not just cinema, right? What makes it different? How is it defined as different? And um, I think one of the things early on was the, the, the context in which the artwork is experienced, right? So cinema, you you know, film, you go to a cinema and that you pay the box office, you go and you sit down and you watch cinema. But um, expanded media and, and video art and experimental cinema would happen um, either in the gallery or in a context that was more associated with the visual arts rather than cinema. So I, I'm posing this question to everyone. Um, do you consider yourself 
filmmakers, you think about that and, and a, a kind of necess necessity of adhering to the language of cinema, or do you have a different way of approaching your work with this, this tool? I like to consider um, the video works as um, sometimes it comes as a necessity to um, introduce movements, um, just like the abstraction of a wave or a signal and see where that signal takes you. Like, um, and then what I like with this um, possibility that the digital tool offers you is the, ram the randomness, um, the interactivity. And those are components that um, when you talk about augmented cinema, that's the direction eventually someday. Um, if um, I consider making like a film in a traditional sense of making like a scenario um, from one point to the, to the other, is um, allowing the viewer to choose what outcome they would actually like, what direction and how many um, iterations there could be of those possibilities. Um, so that's the aspect that I'm mostly interested in eventually in the future. Um, yeah. I think your work, Natalia, was, you know, was, and, and you as well, um, Milko, um, both, you know, were very clearly cinematic and how things were framed. And I think your work, Natalia, in terms of how you were constructing narrative, non-linear as it was, it was a sense of, you know, character building and, and dramatic arc and so on. Um, do you think of, of your work as, as cinema or do you place it in another space? Um, I mean, it's fat for me. I do consider myself a filmmaker, but it's a fascinating, I feel that I am always in between places because I actually, was an actor and I was a I went theater director before I am a filmmaker um, and but for some reason I've ended up making more films than I do direct plays um, so in a way I you know in the theater world I feel like a filmmaker that's making theater and in the film world I feel like I'm a theater maker um, making films um, and I say that because I do have a sensitivity a sensibility to the form of cinema and I feel it comes from an intuitive notion of just watching too many films in my life. Um, but I always feel that I think my, my intuition or my interest is to deconstruct the way that I approach cinema. I was a dancer. So for me, the fact that I am carrying the camera means a lot. And when I give the camera to um, the people that I collaborate with, because I work with a lot of non-actors, I also make them think about and about their relationship to the camera, their relationship to the context that they're in, but also thinking a lot about what exists beyond the frame. So I think what you saw for this um, was a three uh, channel mock-up of an actual installation film. And all of my films to this date are not single channel films, they're multi-channel films, even though they do follow a narrative dramaturgical structure. You know, like the, there is a dramaturgical nonlinear in a nonlinear way, but there is a there is a movement in narrative. Um, but I think going back to this idea of yes, it's the film, but there's a notion of how do I challenge the per the permanence of a film in the live space. So it's really you can see you saw the three channel mock up, and I think you get the narrative and you get the gist of what was going on, but. The experience of watching it live is a very different experience because you're sort of faced with, you know, with the fact that the three images are not next to each other. You're inside the film, like the film is around you and you have to make choices. And then in that way, in the way that it is mounting, mounted, um, the spectator has to edit the film live because even though there's a connective tissue, which I think is the sound or the oral element, you choose the story that you're looking at in the live space. So, I mean, that answers your question. Like, I think it is film, but I feel that in my own interest, I, I, I try to just bring closer to an experience that can be repeated, if not, or that is my, um, my aspiration in the work that I do. 
And Milko, how, how about you? Are you, do you consider yourself a, a filmmaker or do you categorize yourself and your work in, a, in another way? Um, I, um, I, I think we lost the connection with uh, Andrew. Um, so oh dear. Uh, maybe, uh, because I can, I, I can hear- um, can, can another Spanish speaker maybe translate for him? Um, I think what, eh, lo que estaba diciendo Rosa en Milco es, eh, si tú te consideras. Oh, it's for, I, I, oh, it's I understand, for, yeah. Okay. Oh, to translate, to, I can for translate him, yeah. for him, that's helpful. Okay, um, yo, um, yo, si estudié, estudié, eh, me formé como cineasta, eh, pero no, creo que, que, Tener herramientas audiovisuales, una de las herramientas más que se suma como al repertorio de, de herramientas que he tratado como de ganar en mi vida para poder como construir eh, o hacer trabajo creativo, ¿no? O, o, o involucrarlas en mi práctica, eh, práctica cultural. Eh, no, no tengo, un, digamos, en la mayoría de mis obras hay trabajo audiovisual, pero vinculado, digamos, complementario a, a otras eh, a, a otras prácticas como el performance o incluso pintura actualmente estoy investigando sobre temas relacionados al movimiento eh, del cuerpo y seguramente también va a involucrar eh, un tipo de documentación o presentación a través del de audiovisual no pero digamos que es más como una herramienta que utilizo eh, dentro de mi práctica eh, que no necesariamente más en un cineasta, sobre todo por lo que dice anteriormente de, de dónde se exhiben mis trabajos o qué busco con mis trabajos. ¿no? Si quieres traduce eso y después. Hey, um, I typed it. So um, <laughs> what Milka said was that he formed himself as a filmmaker, but one, um, but it was one of the tools that he attained in his life in order to involve and in order to involve it in his cultural practice, because most of his work, even though most of his work is audiovisual. Um, it is complementary to other practices like painting, performance, and recently other topics that are more related to movement. And these, because of these explorations, these explorations will probably require or involve some audiovisual tactics or audiovisual documentation. Um, but once again, it is something that is part of his larger practice because of the spaces that his work is presented. Que diste que tu trabajo más bien se presenta como en galerías, no en espacio quizá no cinemático. Sí, sí, un poco. Y um, por otro lado, también cuando pienso en herramientas audiovisuales, no pienso puramente en, en un trabajo cinematográfico, por ejemplo, eh, sino, no sé, actualmente pienso en todas las posibilidades que, por ejemplo, te da la documentación a través de dispositivos móviles o plataformas de exhibición vinculadas a tecnologías, a, 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 a redes sociales o, o, o otras, otro tipo de tecnología, ¿no? que también pueden funcionar como, como, como salas de exhibición eh, y que un poco, digamos, como una investigación más actual, mi idea, mi, mi, estoy viendo como de qué forma adapto eh, un contenido performático a una plataforma, eh, digamos, como, 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 como re, las, las redes sociales, ¿no? O, o OnlyFans o este tipo de plataformas mm. que al final termina siendo contenido audiovisual, pero no necesariamente es cine, es más, eh, digamos que... Sí, sí, trabajo audiovisual, no necesariamente como eh, cine, eh, como lo concebimos, ¿no? Mm -hmm. um, should I translate? <laughs> yes, please. Oh, okay, yeah. What he says is that when, when Milko thinks about audiovisual practice, he not only thinks of cinematic, of the cinematic practice, but also most recently about mobile devices and social media and other modes of documentation that can also be presented in galleries and exhibition halls. Um, Most recently, he's been thinking about how to adapt performance to other modes like social media, um, OnlyFans, um, and other modes of, of documentation that perhaps are mobile, um, as opposed to cinematic, um, um, cinematic forms. Sí, y por último, para terminar, pero también sé que tengo una estética muy particular en mi obra audiovisual por mi formación como cineasta, entonces eh, en todo mi trabajo hay una constante, que uh -huh. es el uso de planos fijos, o planos fijos en, en primeros uh -huh. planos, o planos fijos en, en eh, digamos, como planos muy abiertos, planos generales que usualmente muestran mucho el entorno, ¿no? pero siempre son como planos fijos. 
que permiten como desarrollar una acción constante en el tiempo sin ningún tipo de corte. Um, and then lastly, he did say that, uh, that he thinks that he has a particular aesthetic because of his formation in film, um, that there is uh, like, um, like an intuitive uh, disposition for like still shots and like long still shots as an opening shot, um, but that he sees that it comes from his formation in film, even though, as I said earlier, you know, he's interested in other modes. Um, what, one of the issues that I wanted to touch on as well, um, and you uh, spoke um, quite beautifully to it, Natalia, is this idea of the body in um, this type of work. Um, not only the body that is being presented on, um, on the screen, but because I think this form um, does, in, you know, allow for a sense of re reflexivity with the maker that the presence of the person behind the camera is something that I think when we look at this kind of work, we're always thinking about. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll start with you, Marilyn. Um, I'm assuming it is your voice that we're hearing in, in the narration, correct? Eh, no. <laughs> it's not. Oh, interesting. No, okay, were you behind the camera? Yeah, al contrario, yo no tengo ninguna formación en el cine. Absolutely no formation in the cinema. So, esto que te embarazas y los tienes y los concibes y cuando nacen, nacen como como ellos prefieran, ¿no? Con sus propias reglas. Entonces, si la pieza quiere nacer siendo una foto, pues la dejo ser. Y si es un video y no sé pues eh, busco quien me ayude, ¿no? Como que prefiero que sea de esta forma, como buscar estas herramientas, pero dejo que sean ellas mismas. Esta pieza yo mandé las instrucciones de cómo hacerla y, y la hicieron en Berlín. Es decir, no la hice en Guatemala. Además, siento que en Guatemala... Eh, pues no sé, el cine en Centroamérica también es bastante escaso, las escuelas de cine son, son caras, eh, tener los equipos también es poco accesible, entonces nada, estás con lo que tenés a la mano, ¿verdad? Entonces, eh, no es mi voz, eso, es, eh, eh, está todo con instrucciones, yo mandé un instructivo de cómo hacerlo y la receta, pues sí, la escribí yo, las recetas de cómo cambiarte los apellidos y cómo quería que se leyera y, busqué, y pedí que fuera alguien que lo hablara en español en Berlín, ¿verdad? Well, this is, I mean, this is how, you know, when I, when I try to teach, I teach cinema, but I, I really try to introduce my students to this approach to making and what I try to do is to get them to connect it to, um, to conceptual art, you know, just to really kind of get them out of that mode of the representational um, or the purely representational. And of course, you know, conceptual art begins with this idea that, you know, the art can be made outside of the artist's own body if you just send a list of instructions, predetermined um, actions that the art can function in that way. Um, and you know, I, when I when I look at your work, Patricia, like I, I watched it and I was like, oh, that's a that's an editor's dream. It's like literally, you know, you kind of place these images in a sequence and then you run this um, protocol that creates this this filter, and that's the film. Um, and so I'm, you know, in in referencing what David was talking about with, you know, what these new technologies allow for in terms of kind of random um, action and intervention into the image. I'm wondering like how much predetermined design um, intention did you have walking into the making of that piece? Well, I definitely was thinking about a, a, a set of time or a set time. The works are in sequence and I grabbed a certain take, you know, from the photographs, because I took photo and video as these events were unfolding in Nicaragua, in Managua, and in Masaya. And so there is, uh, I tried to stay very true to that timeline. 
Um, so there's very specific conse uh, uh, consecutiveness of those uh, of those images, and I chose to stick with the photographs instead of the video. Um, the sound and the out, you know, the the eventual video ideally would be in a room that would have the round sound, and the sound itself is quite abstract as well. You hear, but you can't quite make what they're saying. So it's equally as um, was as abstract as some of the images that you're not able to access, you know, or parts of the images that you're not able to access, and you're only accessing that little sliver that is moving forwards and backwards and then forwards and backwards. Um, and so there is a very, and it's all taken by me. So it's from my perspective, you know, as I'm walking through uh, uh, marchas or what, are, what is that word in English? Marches, I guess, uh, <laughs> protest marches, uh, uh, skirmishes it, between the police and, you know, and protesters. Yours, you're the is it important for you that, that the images are yours and you are the shooter, that you are the person? Yes, it is important because there was a number and there were a number of AP uh, news agencies as well as uh, social media, um, images, videos, photographs that proliferated uh, at that time. And I wanted it to be from my perspective. I thought that that was really important that it was uh, for whatever biased perspective I have, you know, that it had to be from that, from that height and from that vision as I was traversing that space. So for me, it was important that, that it were mine. I could have I mean, there were, you know, hundreds, thousands of images that I could have selected from, but those didn't seem to get at this idea of not being able to see what you're seeing and not being able to access, you know, uh, that or what happens after something happens, you know, that even that I was there, you know, it's like, wow, did I really see that, you know? Uh, so I guess it was important uh, for, for that piece. I, and also sorry, that the idea, you know, going, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, you, you, please. Okay. I was just going to say with the idea of cinema, um, yeah, I'm definitely, you know, I'm formed as a visual artist. I'm not formed as a, a cinematographer. Uh, in, in one, but one thing that I like about certain kinds of cinema and certain kinds of expanded roles that cinema has is this ability to be able to have a dialectic and a dialogue with the audience in a different way that one would have where what where one in a cinema house uh you know having this um or receiving information and i think that uh expanded roles of media or uh, or cinema that's really exciting for me um i think attempt you know creates this other kind of dialogue and discourse between the audience and that space and i think because I mean, I attempt that my work, I'm hoping that my work also creates some of the dialogue. I, I, I'm just trying to stay really fluid in this conversation. So I haven't been watching the time. <coughs> How much time do we have left? Hopefully it's not five minutes. No, you're good, Russell. Um, we have about 40 minutes left. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, so I, I wanted to continue with this this uh, question about about the presence of the body, not only the, the body on in front of the camera, but the body um, behind the camera, and and what that brings to the work. And I know David, you are you are really committed to um, including um, an element of um, of uh, interactivity with your work, right? That your work. Um, always has the possibility of a very kind of immediate visual response to the presence of the audience. Uh, am I correct in this? Um, can you talk about how you got there? Is that where you started when you, you started um, uh, working with, with um, audiovisual uh, media? Or was that something that came later on? Um, my background is um, painting and um, photography when I studied at the visual arts um, school in Martinique, where I teach now. And um, something happened during my 
drawing, automatic drawing sessions where I was just trying to find a space where um, I wasn't trying to be anyone, not an artist, or uh, just try to let go the um, overflow of things um, that were triggered from the daily life. And sometimes when I just kept looking at my drawings, I had the impression of seeing particles or something in movement. So at first I gave the interpretation of um, those particles being a reference to um, microbiology uh, that uh, uh, microorganism that we have in the body. So it, it gave me a link to the, um, the macrocosm and the microcosm in the sense of how I interpret those um, automatic drones. And it just, I just kept on feeling this, um, this attraction to movement, to randomness. And there's where I started to experiment um, about, yeah, where I really tried to see how actually I could have those drones um, become something that are living or that are responding um, to some sort of um, mathematical theory or something. But it really came naturally over the years of um, doing this automatic drawing process that um, even though today when I do a lot of digital work, the base of my everyday work, basically to make it short, if I don't draw within a month or within two weeks um, on a project, I feel that I'm losing my mind, that um, I'm like hypersensitive to every sort of um, external, external um, influences. And when I do draw, that's where I find a space um, where I'm just being in the moment, not trying to be someone else, not trying to be better than someone else, but I'm just in the moment. So that's how the, the, I came to animation by the need of going further in those um, um, spaces where I was able to be myself on paper. And then that took me to questioning the body in space. But I came like really 10 years after um, um, experiment, experimenting first online with um, these micro paintings, animations, where the only interactive element was the mouse and eventually a webcam. And when I moved to Paris um, to continue my studies, I met people from um, the theater world, the dance world, that were my colleagues, but as um, uh, cheaper projects or conceptual artists at uh, La Cité de Sciences de l'Industrie, it's a huge museum um, in the north of um, France. And I became, became aware of the fact that, well, your work shouldn't, um, doesn't necessarily always have to be on, on screen. It can challenge um, space and it could question your the relation to your body um, size or your mental perception. And that's how I got into um, questioning the, um, the immediate response to um, an interface or to sound, uh, the sound that your body makes, uh, the sound that you make in space, and how that can have an interaction with the patterns that I use, uh, the natural patterns usually that I use um, from nature. So it came really, I had the impression that something was pulling me towards it, but it took me a long time to develop the skills because I'm self-taught on that. So it took me a long time to like build the skills to try to find a compromise between what I perceive, uh, what my gut is trying to show me and what I can actually do or perform um, as artistically and also technically. So that's how the, the process came to be. Um, along the body. But when I work with dancers and um, choreographers, you know, or even when I just like observe the, um, the natural public as they enter the space, I'm always surprised by, for me to work, the work works better when technology dis disappears and people only are uh, drawn by, maybe it could be only the sound, but that gives them this sort of, um, um, so on space, so on impression um, to, um, to talk about what um, Patricia said just now. So for me, the, the sound is very important in the relations that the, work, the visual work has and the impact that it has on the body. And I always try to, to work around that, um, even though creating some strange noises that um, my colleagues around here would be like, that's strange. <laughs> Wait, what's that? Um, it has no reference in what we basically know, but 
it feels it feels right for me. So I keep pushing that, although I feel odd sometimes. But um, that's yeah. <laughs> And uh, Kayla, you know, you, you talked about the fact that you, you kind of regret a little bit, including, you know, these, the subtitles on your images, but you're, you're really a writer by your training and practice, correct? So, you know, uh, you know I, I always assume that writers, you know, they, they have this kind of funny, thing where they, they can really hide, but they really can't, you know what I mean? <laughs> you can really see who they are if you really re read them, you know. Um, uh, and so with this, with this piece, you are not there at all on screen, but your presence is very much felt, you know. Um, and so I, I'm wondering about that moment, you know, where you decided, okay, well, let me put in words. Was it that you you felt you needed to be more visible in the piece, and that the images weren't weren't doing enough? Is it was that what was going on? Um. Well, I think well, my in the very end, I'm in the cave. That's uh, my legs, I guess. <laughs> um, but that was just, you know. Um, convenient it you know to put in there in terms of uh how I wanted it to end um but I think I, I <laughs> you're right in what you say and I think for me not so much even in the video but I had lived outside of Barbados for six years um so most of my brought up see or upbringing um and I had been I moved back in the summer so I had been living here now um, you know, only a few months, seven months, maybe. And I think I was just trying to find a place to be in dialogue with people here and also in the region. You know, I think I, um, I had lived a bit in South America. I had visited family in Central America and I was very eager and just bursting to also create more dialogue between Barreiras and the region, you know, our neighborhood. And I think, you know, there's a lot of I think rifts and mistrust in the island that make it difficult to speak candidly. And I didn't know where to find these places physically, you know, like we don't have a cinema house or we don't really have galleries that I felt like you can casually walk into and start speaking to people you don't know so well about, you know, vague or abstract or, you know, such things. So I think, I just, like I said, felt somewhat, you know, physically uh, alone in that moment and alone in these thoughts. And I was a bit fatigued by uh, social media. Like at first I was using Instagram a lot to try and get, you know, feel in dialogue um, on things that were agitating me. Um, so I think when I saw the call for submissions, I felt like, you know, maybe this is something that could generate a, a space for myself that would be inviting to others um, in, in, in the island and in the region um, for lack of the physical space that I, again, that I was aware of, you know, it, it could be out there and I just don't know what I don't know, but that was sort of, I guess, like a um, trying to put out a sensor in a way, you know, um, there, it, it was a, a lot of the, what I had written in was just questions that I don't even think, you know, have one answer or a answer, you know, it's something that I think I wanted to just hear, hear reverberations coming back. Um, and uh, yeah, kind of the lack of having a, a, a physical community around me in that moment. So, well, let's, let's get into a, a kind of a little bit more meta discussion about, about media and specifically our current media um, predicament. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that this, that encouraged this form to evolve was the, the, um, the motivation of activism, right? That uh, mainstream media in the 50s and the 60s just didn't have enough representation. Um, and so artists who were, um, working in the activist world and um, 
saw this as an opportunity to, to have um, broadcast capacity for their statements and messages. Um, and what video did um, is that it allowed for that to be in the hands of an individual. So all of a sudden, um, cinema that required this incredible industrial structure and all of these people to make it all of a sudden could be made by a singular person and express this very unilateral singular perspective. Um, and now that is in the pockets of every 12 year old, that power. And so I'm wondering how, well, first of all, um, how you guys individually um, see this moment um, in relation to media art, right? We are now kind of hyper-saturated with media image now. And so how does art separate itself from the fray of that? Um, that's the first question. And then specifically in your, where you are currently, where you live, I know this was a question that came up in the, in the round table discussions. Um, and Marilyn spoke to it a little bit about access to production tools. Um, so the first question is about how you personally see our current media environment in relation to your work as a media artist. And second, um, how, what is the situation with media capacity, um, not just for artists, but for citizens in where you are right now? Well, maybe if everybody could tell me where they are, because I'm not going to make assumptions about where exactly you are. Yeah, I'll jump. I'm in Puerto Rico. Um, <laughs> um, okay, interesting. I mean, for the first question about engaging with media, um, a film, a fellow filmmaker and collaborator, and I have a joke about how it's going to be how, how in Spanish it's this phrase that is, no están comiendo los dulces, <laughs> which is that um, they're eating, um, they're eating our candy. It's like, oh, uh, you know, these, you know, these kids are going to be great. <laughs> at editing they're better at editing than i am and they're gonna keep you know they're you know i have you know that's one joke but i think for me i've become and i think this is connected to media it's connected to context of where i'm making and and to be very aware of my surrounding when i'm making and sort of which applies to production models and it applies to image making um i think after in puerto rico after um, after the hurricane, um, I became very, very sensitive to the type of images that I'm exporting um, because I realized that there was sort of like an amplified attention to everything that was happening here and a massive exportation of disaster images um, that still I think is very present today, even because there was like an influx of interest in foreign, you know, foreign in the art world and in investment. There was just an interest in Puerto Rico as a space, as a land, as a territory in exploitative means and in non-exploitative means. But I just became very, very aware of that. The image that I'm making is going to be looked at. And for a lot of people who don't have um, context or that can't understand, because I live here and I am was born here and I don't understand. I'm constantly trying to seek a way of not even understanding and beyond this understanding the colonial context of Puerto Rico, but just trying to live you know, and and resist. And the reason why I say that is because I think that also, you know, it applies to the type of image that I'm making and being very aware that what I'm exporting is going to be taken as a truth for a lot of people who have not passed. Um, um, I think in the context of creating images, I've also um, decided to be slow, to slow down, to take my time because I feel that there is a massive, um, massive influx of images. And um, I've also become very aware of the information that I'm putting out there. And if I don't feel that it's information that needs to be received, I am not putting it out there. Um, and then lastly, in, in terms of context, 
um, I've thought about production models because I do know, and you know, and I feel everybody has a different way of producing, but I've, you know, in a place where the minimum wage is still under $8 an hour, um, it doesn't make sense for me to spend um, $1 million on a film unless I am paying everybody um, a wage that they deserve. And the reason why I say it is because I don't spend a million dollars making the films that I do, but I have to be in Spanish, consona con, consona con el contexto. It's like, it doesn't make sense for me. The production model needs to adapt to the realities of a place is what I'm trying to say. So the way that I work, I work with non-actors, I work with collaborators that in a way are also artists and we're thinking collectively. And I, I like to think of filmmaking as a collective rehearsal in understanding a way of existing. Um, and I think that maybe answers the, 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 the question that you posed, hopefully. Yeah. Where are you, Marilyn, in the world? Yo estoy en Guatemala. Eh, bueno, quizás para hablar un poco de Guatemala, Centroamérica, o sea, eh, creo Guatemala que... and Central America, I think the context is... Países, eh, invadidos, colonizados, ¿verdad? Con esta historia y con esta carga eh, súper fuerte que hasta hoy, eh, nada, la pieza que estoy presentando también es, es muestra de esto, de cómo... Eh, nos siguen desapareciendo, por eso era necesario que mi presencia no estuviera en, en el video, digamos, para mí, porque es, es, es como estoy, pero no estoy. Y con relación a, nada, la conciencia que debemos de tener y de ser consecuentes con, lo que, con nuestros discursos, eh, lo que decía Natalia, ¿no? lo de ser... Eh, respetuosos y consecuentes con nuestros contextos porque se va a tomar como una verdad y porque eh, y porque sí es importante tener informa todo tipo de información porque la información que se genera en nuestros países es información que está eh, vendida, comprada eh, la información de los medios eh, pues ya saben no es, se, se, se escucha lo que lo que ha a ciertos grupos les conviene y creo que por eso la, la voz de los artistas es muy muy importante y también por eso es importante que los artistas tengan esta esta responsabilidad no responsabilidad con el con el contexto sobre todo en nuestros países que a mí me pasaba que este año el año pasado tenía amigos en Honduras en Nicaragua y, y no sabía como que habían tormentas, gente viviendo en los techos y los medios no comunicaban nada y, y no se sabía nada. Eh, en Nicaragua no había coronavirus, el presidente no había, no había reglas no, y, y todo esto y parecía un chiste, pero era real. Entonces los medios no están cumpliendo, eh, dando la información que, que necesitamos y, y bueno, no sé, también es muy peligroso que... Que, que todo el mundo pueda tener acceso a, a las redes, a la comunicación, porque, porque es bien fácil de utilizarla y, y, y mal usarla, ¿no? Eh, otra cosa que a mí me impactó muchísimo fue que cuando fui a, cuando he viajado por las exposiciones y cuando fui a mostrar esta pieza a Berlín, era que, nada, había miles de personas haciendo sonido con equipos súper profesionales, gente haciendo cine, video con... Equipos que decía, wow, o sea, en Guatemala jamás esto vamos a tenerlo. Eh, eso, ni siquiera tenemos cines de autor, por ejemplo, no tenemos, eh, no sé, como, como que esta misma inexa, in, que se sea tan inaccesible hace que uno tenga esta necesidad de, de, de buscar en otras, en otras herramientas cómo solucionar esto quizás en Centroamérica, así como hablando a grandes rasgos, ¿verdad? No sé qué dirá Patricia y, y los demás centroamericanos sobre esto, sobre nuestro contexto. Bueno, yo te, yo te diría de que realmente pues coincido mucho y creo que, por ejemplo, en, en, durante la insurrección, ¿verdad? En Nicaragua, ¿verdad? En Masaya, Managua, eh, 
había muchos momentos en los cuales la, la única fuente de, de información realmente eh, venía del de Facebook, de, de Instagram, de Twitter, y, y no había acceso realmente a lo que estaba pasando realmente en las calles o lo que, eh, pues todas las dinámicas que se estaban viendo, ¿no? Eh, o sea, que sí formó una parte elemental eh, en ese momento. Desafortunadamente también han sido usados eso, esos esos videos han sido usados y, ha, y han ha habido muchas represalias, yo creo. Eh, no sé si saben, yo creo que la mayoría de los centroamericanos sí saben de que pues, hay un sinnúmero de personas que están en, en la cárcel ahora, eh, que en algún momento protestaron. Entonces, bastante, en Nicaragua por lo menos es una, es una moneda muy, eh, que tiene dos caras, ¿verdad? Una de libertad, de, de, de divulgar pero por otro lado también pues bastante peligrosa. Eh, creo que eh, sí, como, como en muchos países, incluyendo a donde vivo, que, que es en Estados Unidos, que también en, en el 2019, 2020, sí, bueno, 20, 2019 también, eh, todas las protestas de Black Lives Matter, eh, también solamente se enseñaba una cara de lo que estaba pasando y tampoco se podían ver, ¿verdad?, <ríe> en, en, en los medios, ¿verdad?, eh, lo que estaba ocurriendo en las calles. O sea, que no es solamente algo que está pasando en ciertos países, sino que pasa a, a nivel, eh, o por lo menos yo he estado expuesta a estas dos caras, ¿verdad?, y siendo parte de la diáspora, veía las cosas que estaban pasando aquí, iba a Nicaragua, veía las cosas que estaban pasando allá y era como un momento bastante turbulento. Eh, y ahorita, pues, silencio en Nicaragua. O sea. Um, bueno, yo en mi caso, en mi caso también co coincido un poco eh, con lo que ha dicho eh, Marilyn y Patricia, acá pasa particularmente, por ejemplo, con, con la, el tema que aborda mi pieza, eh, a mí algo que me llamó mucho la atención en todo el proceso de investigación es que, que no, no había una documentación del arte, en el arte eh, eh, sobre esta temática, ¿no? Y en el resto de Centroamérica, sí, en, en, en Costa Rica, en Nicaragua, y, y en Guatemala y Honduras, como que ya se había hecho un trabajo artístico en torno a toda la temática de, del extractivismo de las bananeras, pero en Panamá no y a mí eso me llamó mucho, mucho la atención, entonces de ahí también venía necesidad de generar como un registro de esto a través del arte, que, 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 que digamos que sí, sí existía en Panamá, pero desde la iconografía de la banana, no necesariamente hablando sobre el extractivismo, sino más como utilizando la banana como una especie de, 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 de iconografía, ¿no? Eh, de la cultura popular y, y demás. Entonces, a mí, bueno, eso fue una de las principales razones por la cual también decidí hacer la pieza y a partir de, de la pieza, pues, eh, tratar de generar una serie de conversación en torno a... Eh, también me parece importante, eh, aquí en Prima pasa que el arte... Eh, aquí solo... Bueno, igual pasa mucho en Centroamérica, hay solo una ciudad, y es la ciudad como principal, que es la más grande, y el arte se concentra usualmente en la ciudad, entonces toda la narrativa en torno al arte va en torno a la ciudad y en torno a, digamos, a las personas que siempre han tenido acceso al arte, que son personas que están en la ciudad y que han podido ir a las escuelas y demás. Entonces, digamos que todo esto, todas estas otras eh, realidades que están fuera de la ciudad usualmente tampoco se han abordado en el arte porque no hay artistas que son de estos espacios, ¿no? Porque no, porque, porque no, no, porque no, hay, una, no hay acceso o por lo que sea, en mi caso es porque yo soy del lugar, decidí que tenía que hacer algo sobre esto, porque pues, es parte de mi historia, pero usualmente digamos que el arte de Panamá se concentra eh, sobre temáticas de la ciudad, y um, sí, eso pasa por un lado, también es, es muy similar con el tema de los medios, no, no se cubren eh, los conflictos que, que, que hay en, en el país, eh, ahora actualmente hay un conflicto súper grande con eh, so, eh, con el tema minero, el desplazamiento de población indígena, de territorio indígena, eh, hay como to están todas estas problemáticas pasando que, que na nadie se entera, eh, y pues hay esfuerzo por parte de grupos activistas, pero no hay mucho eh, más allá de eso, ¿no? Eh, entonces esto es un poco como, como el, el estado de, del país.
Okay, so we do have um, some time left. I have so many more questions. I think there are things about um, that this question of, of access leads to in terms of questions about context, um, which is what uh, Milko was, was starting to get at, is that like where do we see art and where does work like this kind of function within the society? I remember um, I was I was part of the, the first conversations around T, with TVE and that came up immediately. You know, is like what what when we when we talk about media practice in these spaces, are we talking about this art world stuff, or are we talking about like you know um, what some people call vernacular or vulgar cinema, where um, cinema that is not you know um, uh, functioning in you know these kind of highly stylized commercial modes but are you know cameras picked up in the hands of the ordinary citizen that wants to make a movie and we get these crazy stories and a lot of that happened um at the turn of the 20th century with the proliferation of video camera and editing equipment um thus i think a conversation that we need to keep having as part as of tde to make sure that we don't end up doing exactly what Milko is talking about in terms of siloing ourselves and this kind of work. But um, we'll leave that for another time. What I, what I would like to do now is to open up the conversation to other folks that are in the room and to the artists as well. Um, if you have questions that you would like to pose to each other or folks that are joining us, if you have questions for the artists, now is the time. I actually want to jump in porque yo sí tenía una pregunta um, para Milko. <laughs> porque um, cuando vi tu pieza, um, concuerdo con creo que algo que quizá dijo Rosel anteriormente um, acerca de esta toma, de esta larga toma en la que tenemos que verte a ti caminando. Um, y en los primeros minutos de la pieza, bueno, incluso más adelante, me quedé pensando quién era la persona que estaba operando la cámara. <risa> eh, me, me empecé a preguntar en estar so o sea, en un punto yo me adjudiqué que estaba solo eh, y pensé que estaba solo, pero me daba un poco de curiosidad de quién es la persona que estaba operando, que yo creo que es una pregunta paralela a quién es la persona que estaba mirando. Eh, eh, nada, la tiro porque es algo que se me quedó en la mente cuando vi la pieza. Ay, eh, en realidad, eh, la pieza fue eh, un, una especie de encargo del Museo de Arte Contemporáneo para una exhibición que se, llama, que se llamó Mesotrópico. Creo que Marilyn estaba ahí también con, con obras en la exhibición. Y en realidad fue una excusa para hacer un viaje. Eh, en el viaje me acompañó mi mamá y mi mejor amiga. Eh, entonces... Eh, fue como así, prácticamente una excusa para como acercarme a reconectar un poco, ¿no? Entonces, el, quien estaba detrás de la cámara todo el tiempo eh, eh, era mi mejor amiga, que no tiene idea de arte, que no tiene idea de nada, que ella ya, ya luego se burlaba de mí y era como, todo lo veía como video performance, pero eh, creo que el... el eh, o sea, ya no entendía un poco que, que, era, que era nada de lo que estaba haciendo, ¿no? Pero, pero sí me, me acompañó, digamos, en el proceso y y también en el segundo plano donde me estaba asfixiando eh, también fue el ejercicio de oye si ves que me, que, que me desmayo algo asfixiándome corre y quítame la bolsa de la cabeza o algo ¿no? pero eh, sí fue, fue como mi mejor amiga que me acompañó y yo seteaba la cámara y ella le daba como rec a la cámara y grababa y, ya, y al final eh, eh, Tenía, ella tenía otra, otra como concepción completamente distinta de lo que era el arte, como el, el viaje y en, en todo este encuentro con, que no se ve en la pieza, pero hubo un encuentro con un montón de gente, de personas que, que nos tiraron información, que nos ayudaron, que nos acompañaron. Eh, para, ella, para los dos fue como muy transformador. ¿no? La comunidad en sí nos apoyó muchísimo en la, en la elaboración de la pieza en general. Gracias. I don't have a comment, but I wanted to respond to what David was saying about your piece and how it was really interesting to hear about the origins of how your 
you know, you would be drawing and you would think about these microorganisms in the body. And it was really striking when I watched your piece for the first time, because I've just in general, as of late, had frustrations with the media landscape, making my attention just so short and just so bad. And I find a lot with like music videos, especially it's a lot of editing that's very choppy and a lot of a lot of trying to keep up with the ever, um, sh you know, short attention spans of audiences. But I found that you had one shot, but the way in which your technique, I guess, created this movement. Was so like, I just wanted to jump into the screen. So it's interesting that, you know, you desired this more, you know, um, surrounded experience because that's also what I was craving while I was watching this just to be like within this, this you know audio visual experience um so that was a really um i think it really made sense as you were explaining this i i have a yeah. question oh sorry sorry so, david you respond first no i just wanted to say that um what i was working on on that particular piece um it came to mind to give the impression or try to um, give the connotation that everything is linked, that we are energy and we are linked to the invisible uh, within ourselves and beyond. And that's, um, although there was a team that um, talks about resistance and our pop the population, the rise of a population, um, I felt it more uh, in a sort of um, spiritual and cosmic way. Usually in the work that I do, um, it's quite abstract um, with patterns and stuff, as I said before. And sometimes in certain um, art residencies that I do, the people that I meet, artists that I meet, they are always telling me, yeah, but there's something that, 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 has, that looks like um, a sort of aura that's emanating from people or from the scope. But I never talked about it. I never like challenged that because I'm always like, I'm gonna leave people or the public interpret that in their sense. But in this particular piece, I felt that um, the metaphor of the rise of a population goes beyond um, the, like, the visual representation. And I just wanted to give the impression that there was this sort of impulse, like a wave. Uh, and once like when a, a drop falling in the water or rock falls in the water, those ripples and those ripples that will actually um, nourish generations to come. So something in, in there, in that making happen, but it happened really like organically. Um, if I thought of it, I'm not sure I would have made it that way. So it just came into, into the frame. Thank you, David. I um, just wanted to ask to all of the artists generally, and particularly actually to David or Natalia, who have these kind of pieces that were designed to be shown in a, in a, physical, in a physical space, essentially, with the three channel video, or David often has this interactive element to his work or this immersive element to his work. And I mean, honestly, with everybody's pieces, to have that physical option taken away and only have the exhibition online, which is something that the TVE team had to, you know, go back and forth with and ultimately decide that it wasn't safe um, at the time to have a physical exhibition. How, how you feel that kind of impacted um, the showing of your work, if you were happy or, you know, as satisfied as you could be with that kind of online format and like the pros and cons of that, um, that situation we found ourselves in. Um, yeah, for me, it's, it's, it's a good question because I feel that the pandemic or the context of the pandemic has made me, um, has made me miss liveness a lot. Um, and has made me become now a bit more adamant about the fact that I, I want my work to be experienced live. And that being said, um, it, um, I think it does present a fascinating opportunity too, because I, I, sometimes I'm too married, I'm too much of a purist <laughs> with my initial ideas of like, no, it needs to be experienced in this way. And I think what has, um, what I've learned from this experience was that, you know, 
to trust that the work has been done in some way that there is still a work that is able to be experienced even though it's not the way that i would have liked it in my ideal world for it to be seen it's just a different experience and it has had the opportunity of you know this piece i've never thought of sharing it as a three channel piece um mainly with people who ask to watch it but it has had an opportunity to reach people that cannot be in the physical space um which you know even though i have so much resistance to the virtual i also feel like the virtual can be a consciousness <laughs> you know and and it has been and i think that's sort of like a good you know a good learn lesson that i've learned is that um opportunities like this um allow reach and allow other people that don't have the opportunity to be in person to also to also see it I agree with um, Natalia on that um, aspect of things. Um, I think the work being online uh, would touches like a broader audience and meet and would probably be seen by people that maybe would never go into a gallery or we feel uncomfortable in those sort of um, spaces. So like, that's the the positive aspect of um, of it. Um, and then I think it's the fact of allowing people to um, to be more at ease with their personal experience with the piece. Obviously, the equipment, um, the size of the screen, and the size of the work, um, the body relationship with the work is different. But um, I still like the aspect that maybe uh, a broader um, scope of, of people that maybe initially was not interested and could have been surprised by the by the, the the content of the piece actually yeah i would echo that i think that having the ability to disseminate the work to be able to have a kind of broader way uh, of contact um and have other participants that might not have been able to i mean i i guess in an ideal world world it would be both you know you'd have you know this online presence but also you'd be able to be in in person because i think uh for some of the works it would be lovely to be able to be in those spaces and be able to be immersed you know in 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 that experience um I want to also ask a question about authorship to the to the various artists, because I think that a lot of you have in some cases, you know, Natalia, you talked about collaboration and collaborating with other artists and how that then reverberates in the work. Marilyn, you know, you've you've given over, you know, the the, the instructions and, and somebody else you know does the production how does that impact the work and i think in various ways i think uh you know some of you have worked with family members or friends you know how how does that aspect um affect the way that the work um gets done or or gets uh if, if affected or or produced En mi caso, yo trabajé con un colectivo de guatemaltecos en Berlín, que son Voces de Guatemala en Berlín, y ellos están muy, bueno, son activistas además, y están como eh, hablando sobre todos estos problemas sociales que ocurren en Guatemala desde Berlín, y me pareció interesante trabajar con ellos porque también tienen esta parte social esta parte activista y la pieza yo no la nombro como mía sino es una pieza que hicimos en colectivo es decir ellos la pueden utilizar y yo también entonces eh, nada y luego una vez que está en plataforma es de quien la necesito utilizar porque al final es un docu documento un documento verdad que, que narra una situación de un evento que está sucediendo en Guatemala un poco ahí Um, sí, o sea, para, para mí yo creo que va un poco de, eh, bueno, esta colaboración en particular fue con mi mamá, así que ya yo creo que nosotras llevamos colaborando desde antes que yo naciera, <ríe> seguiremos colaborando hasta el más allá, um, pero en general me gusta pensar en la colaboración particularmente, y yo creo que para mí mi, mi, mi deseo de colaborar viene un poco más de la intención que yo 
quiero ponerla a mi trabajo, que es que si se vuelve una cámara de eco para mí misma, pues entonces no estoy teniendo diálogo. El punto es tener diálogo con otras personas, no solo en la gente que lo mira, sino la gente que lo, que lo copiensa, que lo, que lo piensa conmigo, que mira, que me acompañan a mirar. Y yo creo que es una perspectiva que viene mucho del teatro, que en, en dirigiendo teatro... Yo, uno se da cuenta que en realidad uno simplemente la dirección o esta idea de como el dirigir y el tener control es una falacia. <risa> que en realidad me he dado cuenta que, que como el trabajo es uno de mirar, es uno de observar un fenómeno y dejar que el fenómeno exista. No es como de ser parte de un fenómeno y, y simplemente estar lo atenta suficiente para poder darte cuenta de las cosas brillantes que ya están sucediendo. Y pues pienso mucho en eso cuando estoy trabajando con personas, que es como ya, la, ya lo que está pasando es excelente, es increíble, es cuestión de cómo, de cómo tú tienes la sensibilidad para darte cuenta y cómo tú acompañas en el caso de esta pieza, a, a, cómo yo invito a gente que me acompañe a mirar, eh, que para mí es un acto más, como, más comunal. Eh, pero que también invita a otro tipo de reflexión, otro tipo de conversación. Anali, do you want to say your question out loud or <laughs> should I read it? Anali, place that question in chat. <laughs> okay, I think we've hit time. Um, yeah, that too. <laughs> yeah. I, mm -hmm. um, Well, I'll, I'll leave the, the final salutations to the TVE team, but uh, just for my one part, it was really a pleasure to, to meet all of you. Um, and as TVE, I think, is, is clearly designed to do, it is always such a pleasure to see other folks in the region working um, in this arena. Um, mm -hmm. So thanks for having me, all, all of you, and I look forward to um, continued dialogue. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Russell. Gracias. Yes, gracias. Thank you so much. Gracias a todos. Nice meeting you all. Gracias. Thank you so much. Everybody. To everyone. <laughs>